first of all, uh, Martin, I'd quite like to get your uh, perspective um, because you have really um, focused a lot on um, the campaign against <laughs> modern slavery, a very successful campaign um, which the CCLA has been involved in. Um, that is involved, of course, getting policymakers on board, um, really kind of ch making big changes within the industry. And this is what we're hearing from Tim, that there needs to be a kind of kick start and get everybody on board. How have you managed to do that? And how do you think that could actually have an impact here when we're talking about changing the types of food that we grow? Thank you. Um, so the ILO, um, the International Labour Organization, has estimated that there are 50 million uh, modern slaves in the world. And unfortunately, um, 28 million of them are in forced labour. And since the estimates were last done in 2017, the number has risen by 10 million. Um, and that is due to um, conflict, COVID, and climate breakdown, as we've just been discussing. Um, and I don't think I need to tell this audience that modern slavery is, risks are high in the agricultural system, which is very reliant on migrant labor, um, seasonal workers. Um, and you can look all around the world from, from palm oil from Malaysia, cocoa from West Africa, uh, shellfish and prawns from Thailand, um, tomatoes from Italy, and indeed, as I'll talk about later, um, in the UK agricultural system. Um, but CCLA is, stands for Church, Charities and Local Authorities. We're an investment management company that uh, manages a lot of money for the church, charities and local authorities. And we've been working on modern sla slavery since 2012. But in 2019, we created Find It, Fix It, Prevent It as a collaborative investor initiative to tackle modern slavery. And we recognized at that time that um, whilst a lot of companies were saying that they were committed to the fight against modern slavery, um, they weren't actually taking very much action. There was a lot of policy conformance, but not much um, actual evidence that they were actually tackling the issues. So Find It, Fix It, Prevent It is designed to uh, do what it says on the tin. Um, and we engage companies. We ask them in our, our first conversation, have you found modern slavery in your supply chains this year? And if not, why not? And that just flips the whole uh, discussion on its head. It's less about um, are you committed and do you have the right policies? And it's actually are you taking the right action? And I think that that has really helped us engage with a number of different sectors around modern slavery. But it's not all we do. We also engage in the public policy sphere. And I'm really pleased to say that uh, Dame Sarah Thornton, who was the UK's Independent Modern Slavery Commissioner, um, joined the team in uh, October. And she has contacts across government and is not afraid to criticize the government on their public policy. So that's been really great. And then the, thing, uh, the third thing that I would say that we think is really important is data for investors. Um, and I think, you know, when you're talking about agricultural systems, when you're talking about modern slavery, uh, the data available to investors to actually be able to analyze who is doing good, good work, who is committed to making these changes and who isn't, is really hard to come by. Um, and so we really uh, focus on how can we work with all of the different stakeholders we work with to get better data so that investors can make really meaningful decisions with their investments. Okay, Martin, thank you very much. Well, let me bring in Sophie Lawrence. You're talking about um, uh, data there. Tell me a little bit more about um, uh, the Investor Coalition on Food Policy and also the Food Data Transparency Partnership, which I believe is, is part of this. This focus on ensuring that investors um, are presented with the right data to take the right um, de decisions and actions. Just how crucial is that? Yeah, it's, it's vital. So um, the Investor Coalition on Food Policy um, exists to harness the power of the um, investment community in engaging on food policy, which is a huge, huge kind of scope. But um, we've narrowed that slightly to focus on anything that's uh, linked to healthier, sustainable and affordable food system. Um, and we've heard so eloquently from, from Tim outlining the risks that are facing the food system. And that's really why 
uh, this has galvanized such an interest in from invest investors. Um, but the window of opportunity for us was the national food strategy that came out in 2021. We were really pleased to see in there a recommendation around mandatory reporting of health and sustainability metrics. Um, that might sound really dry, but from an investor's perspective, that is so important because unless we have consistent, comparable data that we can look across the different companies in our portfolio, understand the risks they're facing, understand the opportunity as well, it's not just about the risks, then we can make the right decisions in terms of how we allocate our capital. It's also not just about risk. It's so important, such an important part of it, but there's also that moral and social imperative to act given the challenges that we're all facing. Um, so we set up the, co the coalition. It galvanised a lot of interest. We've heard the six trillion, which has been brilliant. Um, and we've been engaging with, with government officials, with ministers, um, and we were so pleased to see them set up the Food Data Transparency Partnership, which is going to be this open <coughs> policy dialogue between investors, banks, uh, civil society, academia, um, and officials to really decide on what the right metrics are to be reported across health, animal welfare, and environment. Um, but also for consumers to create kind of mandatory uh, guidelines around eco-labeling. Um, and this isn't about increasing the burden on companies or increasing the amount of data that they have to, 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 to report. It's really about getting to consistent, comparable data so that we can make the right decisions as investors, but also as consumers. Um, and government can also um, have that data to be able to drive policy decisions. But how does that work globally? You so we're starting it, on the yeah. UK with the UK mm -hmm. focus. I mean, but we obviously have this you've got this, you know, interlinking. You can't absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And I think one of the things we'll be calling for is is also that this this whatever reg regulation we have in the UK. And I, I think what's really important to say is the UK would be leading in in putting this kind of regulation in place. We will hopefully see a kind of ripple effect. Absolutely, we invest in multinational companies. We want to be able to see this apply to their multinational kind of operations. But I do think we have to start with 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 a policy process. I think that's when we're thinking about how we engage as investors with policymakers, we have to engage as part of the process that's happening. So I think we have to use the UK as, um, as the first test case um, and then absolutely think about how that spreads more broadly. And, and that's an important thing because investors can actually have, we, we have that global kind of footprint. A lot of the um, investors that are part of our coalition are institutional global investors. So this, you know, absolutely we can use that investor voice to leverage in, in other jurisdictions as well. Okay, great, thank you. Well, let's get the Danish perspective now. Rune Christopher Dragstahl, at DBK, um, you've really been instrumental in engaging with the Danish government on the Danish Green Deal. Can you tell me a little bit about the Green Deal um, and just how it, uh, see, it, it, it um, really focuses on food in general and what impact that has made? Yeah, thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me here to tell a bit about that. Um, so basically, uh, as part of a lot of se whole series of climate negotiations for various sectors, there was an outstanding a deal waiting on agriculture, on food and agriculture. So it was negotiated for a very long time, and starting with the result, uh, of course, it was a broad deal regarding anything from you know that relates to existing conventional agriculture and the animal production as well. But then as something really groundbreaking and new, there was the decision to establish a national fund of approximately 100 million euros over several years, uh, targeting uh, plant-based foods, developing them also, did, you know, anything relating to you know making this sector grow as a new part. Many of you are used to Danish bacon and butter. So basically this is uh, seeing the new, the future, whatever, whether that will be uh, whether that will be, you can say, imitation products or something completely new that doesn't have to look like meat or diary or just simply making people used to eat more legumes, <laughs> whatever it is, the whole broad, uh, you know, plant-based foods in the broader sense. A fund for that and as well the decision to make a national action plan for plant-based foods. The wonderful thing about that deal from, from a, you can say, from a perspective that can actually make you believe in this, and that might even also be uh, convincing internationally, is that it was supported by nine out of ten parties in the parliament. The, it, that includes the whole left, centre and right wing. That is also important because that makes it long-lasting. It also, and, and a really important part of why it was reached, why, because the government at that time, the Social Democrats were in power uh, alone, but they wanted a broad coalition of parties, but it also meant that you had to give something to all the different parties. And then through that process, we can get into detail into that later, but we actually managed to um, be in dialogue with several parties to make this a key priority in the negotiations. So if you have nine parties, 
and three of them approximately actually prioritize developing the plant-based sector. Um, not to, it's not about destroying the existing animal sector, but it's uh, the whole way we've also talked about it. This is an addition, it's a new development, it's something positive, it's something we want more of. Getting into that kind of language also creates less resistance. So, so, for, so somehow, not magically, I can get into more detail if you want to, we have a few more concrete things we did, but we managed to actually to, to get a lot of uh, organizations, types of actors, including farmers and political parties, to actually unite around this. And since the deal has been made, now it's something almost all the parties really speak positively about. So what did you do concretely to try and get everybody on board? Can you give me those examples? Yeah, so I think uh, the, the first thing, we did a, a, a several things. Some of them we took the initiative to. Others, uh, some other organizations took the initiative to. Because since we are the key uh, plant-based organization in Denmark, we were involved in all of it and did a lot of the actual uh, paperwork. You know, someone has to write the joint report <laughs> together with other actors. But uh, first of all, we launched something we call Danish Network for Plant Proteins. That is, uh, I would say somehow, you know, you have a lot of uh, wonderful professionals here today. Again, holding several events throughout the year for anyone interested in this to make them meet each other, to make them network. Of course, you create a program that is, that is balanced. You have some panels and presentations, but, but make a variation of events throughout the year where there may be one thing is the actual content of the presentations that can serve as a mini education, but also the networking between people. It really matters. Secondly, through is launching that network, which now has approximately just a bit less than 200 professionals uh, from uh, in Denmark within the food system in, it broad, in its broadest sense. So the, the biggest Danish farmers union, those who also do organize Danish Crown and Ala, have all their producers and the big companies as members. They were impressed with the interest in this network, so they invited us to make a joint research and development strategy for plant-based foods. Again, not a single word about animal production in it. We're focusing on what we can agree on, on developing something new, on something positive. That's how they invited us for that. Thirdly, we did make a joint uh, initiative together with the Organic Denmark, which includes the organic farmers, but also the organic companies. They're a bit more green, progressive, so they're also more into to plant-based, because if you want to do it organic, you will also need to eat more plant-based, otherwise you'll produce less food <laughs> overall. And finally, uh, we, uh, together with some other NGOs like Greenpeace, uh, the Nature Conservation Society, Animal Protection Denmark, made a joint report with the plant-based uh, Food Association of Denmark, uh, a vision report on the future. So all these different initiatives together created an atmosphere that, that uh, made it somehow, I don't know, policymakers, uh, both people within the administration, but also actual politicians attended these events, heard about these initiatives, and became starting to digest it all. And that's really important also, I think, it has to seep into the actual administration, the people sitting there deep within the, the government administration, not just the politicians who might be there temporarily. And, and finally, we found a way to talk about this that did not alienate people, where it was not a conflict between vegans and meat lovers. And finding a way to talk about this, that we are all in the same boat, this is about something we can do together, which has also health economic benefits, as uh, Professor Benson uh, mentioned, I think, before. And that whole way of doing it um, creates a common ground, less hostility, and actually mean you can get a lot of different actors on board, and ultimately, many parties, uh, key negotiators, found that Interestingly, the Vegetarian Society of Denmark became a preferred partner to call to when they needed input on the food system in Denmark. Mm -hmm. Big surprise, right? <laughs> <laughs> Rune Christoph, that's really uh, fascinating. I want to bring in Jessica. So as Rune Christoph has been talking about, you know, it's trying to find those points of agreement rather than launching straight away into highly controversial topics, finding that area where actually there can be an al alignment, maybe starting from the outside and then bringing the policy to the middle. I mean... You have recently established the Long-Term Investors in People's Health Initiative, um, spearheaded by Share Action. Are you finding that that strategy might be working? How are you um, really pushing this forward? Yeah, thank you. And it's so great to hear about all of the work going on in, in Denmark. It's really exciting. Um, so, yeah, Share Action are a responsible investment NGO. Uh, we work with the investment system to drive towards a healthier planet and population and, and as you say we've recently launched <coughs> our long-term investors in people's health program 
Um, so this is really all about working with the investment system to unleash the positive potential that they have to improve people's health. Uh, and this builds on work that we've been doing for years, um, focused on the, the food system. Um, so really calling on uh, manufacturers and retailers to grow their proportion of healthier sales. Um, so we've been doing that for a long time, but of course, nutrition is just one element of health. And we think it's really important that we start to bring health in a more holistic sense into that ESG conversation. And, and so that's what we're really trying to do. Um, so we're working with investors to drive towards a healthier uh, and fairer society, ultimately. Um, so we do lots of work specifically on nutrition within that. Of course, it's a really important part. Um, and we've got a, a fantastic group of investors who are collaboratively engaging with a whole host of the leading uh, and largest sort of retailers and manufacturers. Um, but we also have, and I think relevant to this discussion today, we also have a focus on, on policy. And of course, uh, you know, investors can influence food, food related and, and other health relevant policy. But it's also really important that the right uh, incentives, policy and regulatory incentives and uh, rules are in place to really enable investors to confidently and collaboratively engage on these issues. And so within Share Action, we're really focusing on our policy work on reforming the rules and incentives that enable investors to, to go further and faster. Um, so just to really kind of bring that to life, because I know it's, it's a little bit nebulous. Um, so one of the things that we've been doing is, um, for example, last year, we responded to the consultation uh, on the European Sustainability Reporting Standards really trying to encourage them to embed health relevant <laughs> metrics into those reporting standards because we know that's incredibly important for investors and other stakeholders to be able to hold companies to account for their impact on health. One of the other more um, emerging things that we're doing at the moment in terms of our policy work, um, some of you may have heard the Competitions and Markets Authority just a couple of weeks ago announced a plan to ease restrictions on how closely companies can collaborate on climate change initiatives. And we're uh, starting to engage with them to try and say, well, actually, that's a great idea, but should be extended to social goals as well. So we're trying to encourage the Competitions and Markets Authority to, uh, to make it easier for investors to collaborate um, for better health, for better social outcomes, as well as for better climate outcomes. Um, and we know that that's something that investors have cited as, as a key barrier to them in joining our collective engagement um, activities. Um, so yeah, we, we are continuing to work with investors, driving towards better human health. Um, and we're, we're doing that through both uh, collaborative company engagement, but also engaging on the policy side as well. Great, thanks, Jessica. Uh, Martin, what do you make of uh, Jessica's example about the best <laughs> ways to kind of engage with policymakers and what to focus on? What have you found um, in terms of how you've been engaging? Where have, the, where have you had most success? Um, I, I want to just talk about a, a recent example um, at the tail end of last year. Um, you may have seen the news stories about the UK seasonal worker scheme, which um, um, I don't need to tell anyone in this room that the UK agricultural system has been reliant on low wage workers from uh, Eastern Europe for a very long time. And that due to Brexit and the, the war in Ukraine, um, we faced huge labor shortages. And so the government introduced this seasonal worker scheme, which was uh, designed to bring in workers from as far away as Nepal and Indonesia. And these, these workers um, were offered six, week, six months' work, um, and many of them were sent home after two weeks, but they were all um, paid huge amounts of recruitment fees in their source country, and um, they also um, were in tune to the debt of about £3,000 each, and they would come from very vulnerable, low-wage countries. Um, and we estimate that sort of eight of the 11 ILO indicators of forced labour are present in the seasonal worker scheme. So um, we actually uh, 
worked with investors in the Find It, Fix It, Prevent It program, um, and we developed a collective statement on this, um, which we put out in the media, and it was covered in the Financial Times. We've also engaged with stakeholders across, um, well, the supermarkets themselves, the British Retail Consortium, the Ethical Trading Initiative, um, Food Network for Ethical Trade, um, and, and DEFRA on, on this issue. Um, and, and we know that, that, that it's had an impact, that actually the supermarkets are now talking about um, how they implement the employer pays principle so that no workers um, who are recruited from abroad will have to pay to get their jobs um, and that those workers that were recruited last year um, have access to remedy and some of those, that money gets paid back. But of course the, the issue is that um, we're in the middle of a cost of living crisis and nobody wants to, to pay for, for those uh, extra fees. And, and we know that at, at least at the, super, at the farm level, it would be ab absolutely disastrous for the farms to, be, to um, pay, pay the, the real cost for bringing workers over from those that far away. So we're in dialogue with the supermarkets, with DEFRA, about how that scheme can be re redesigned. Um, and those costs be incorporated across the supply chain. Okay, thank you. Oh, I can see you nodding uh, a lot there, Arun Christopher. Uh, tell me, you know, what you, where you believe your best successes have been. I mean, you talked about what you've done to <coughs> engage investors and policymakers. Um, where are you seeing real progress, though? But. Mm, well, yeah, I've, a lot of the stuff that has happened is, I guess, <laughs> real progress, but, but I do think uh, to get more into detail about what is working also, it is really the business arguments. The, when you look into, we've actually collected, uh, there are lots of scenarios, you know, probably Bloomberg, Barclays, Credit Suisse, all of the big uh, investment uh, companies and houses all the world have made their predictions for the future market of, of plant-based products or all alternatives to conventional meat and dairy. And we, we actually took all of these predictions and put them together in one kind of graph. Um, and just that one slide showing all these predictions but put together is sort of showing an average joint agreement about where we are heading. And that is showing that it will increase bit by bit. It's still pretty high growth rates, probably 10% a year in these years, but it's still coming from a low point of departure. But then towards the end of the 20s, there seems to be a common agreement that then will st start increasing much more in the late 20s. And then after 2030, 2035, the big question, of course, is whether if we want to reach the climate targets, there should eventually be a, be a big takeover of, of uh, some of the current market. That's what Credit Suisse is predicting, that really basically the main food system in 2050 will be plant-based. That's their scenario. But, but, but bringing all these different investment uh, projections together has actually really been helping both investors and but, but, company, but the government also and business actors to see this is where we are heading. The disagreement might be at what speed are we heading there, um, yeah, when will we actually reach what point? When will this be more than just a niche market? Uh, but, uh, but these things, and just, just that one slide, when you put it all together, that so many big investment houses and banks actually do agree that this is where we're heading. I think that has been the most effective thing because that is where we have managed to, you know, considering the UK political situation, which is slightly different from the Danish one, um, but um, <laughs> to say the least. Um, um, Enjoy your <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, but uh, <laughs> yeah. no. But but the uh, point is that that um, the arguments that work. The more we move towards the centre and right wing of the aisle, the more the business arguments become really important. And at least the business arguments that make it some politicians on the centre right side actively on board, or at least they will stay somehow calm and follow the situation and taking some of that conflict and tension between usually it might be some right or left wing thing here. We really have to do that with the whole plant-based thing, taking the right left wing tension out of that because this is a big investment case. And when you see uh, that greater political harmony, do you think that then nudges um, public opinion as well and encourages that change in diet? It, it means a lot if you can take some of the conflict out of that. It also means that suddenly you can actually have after the plant-based, uh, sorry, after the big agricultural deal was made and an interviewer kept pushing him, so you know, are you sure we're not going to lose jobs in the future with this deal? What will happen? And then after being asked three times by the journalist, then our finance minister said, well, perhaps we'll create new jobs within the plant-based sector. Mm -hmm. Reaching that point where a finance minister dares say that, 
I think is really crucial. Because, <laughs> um, yeah, finance minister and prime minister are usually the ones holding the power, right? So you want them on board, really, to really move things and to make it normal and, and somehow more neutral. Okay, we can cross our vote. Thank you. Um, so, Sophie, would you say that you've got cross-political support for what you're doing? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, so we've really been learning as we've gone along. We've actually looked at the inspiration of Find It, Fix It, Prevent It as a real model um, for how we start with that engagement process. Um, and I think a lot of it has really been, yes, um, we've had a lot of leadership changes. So actually the, 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 the officials level has been um, the one where we've been engaging the most. Um, and now as part of this food data transparency partnership process, that, that will also be the case. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely across the board. Um, just to pick up on a, a point that you were just mentioning, I think that this is a, a really important one, which is the, the benefit that we have as investors is actually that kind of bird's eye view, being able to articulate the long-term risks that we're facing without being entrenched in a particular kind of company uh, mentality or, or very specific value chain. And I think the, you know, as Jess has already spoken about, we've been engaging, some investors have been engaging and, and supported by brilliant organisations like Share Action, Access to Nutrition Initiative, on this issue for a long time, but it's really uh, gaining momentum. Um, and, and I think we're getting better at connecting some of these systemic risks as well. And I just want to pick up on that because I think that the economic argument is so strong, you cannot you know, really ignore it right now. And that's been really powerful as we've been engaging with, with, with our kind of government process is putting that argument at the forefront. So, so Jess, what would you say that the key issues are for investors to consider uh, really when it comes to investing in food businesses? Yeah, it's a, it's a gift of a question. Um, and I, I suppose I would be um, encouraging all investors at the point that they're thinking of investing in a food company to think particularly about four questions. Um, so is that company assessing, mitigating, uh, and, uh, and disclosing its risks uh, relevant to health? Um, is that company over-reliant on the sales of unhealthy products uh, for profit? What are its plans to mitigate uh, risks coming from regulation and, and other, other types of risks? Um, and is the company disclosing information in a way that is transparent and allows com uh, comparing across the industry? So I think those are, those are four really key questions that all investors should be asking of all food companies. Um, but, but of course, once uh, an investor is invested in a food company, we really want to see, and, and we know that lots of investors already are doing these things, but we really want to see investors using all of the tools uh, and resources they have at their disposal to drive those companies and support those companies to move towards a healthier, more sustainable um, way of, of being. And so that includes um, dialogue at one-to-one -one engagement meetings with these companies. It may include joining collaborative engagements like the ones that we run at Share Action or, or by others. It definitely includes using your voting power uh, to encourage companies to do, to do more for health. Uh, it may include asking AGM questions, putting these, uh, these topics uh, right there up on the board's agenda. Um, and, and for some, it may also involve uh, being involved in filing a shareholder resolution, um, which is one really good, um, good way of escalating that engagement where there's been um, a consistent lack of progress. So there's lots of things that investors can do all investors will take a slightly different approach, but there's also lots of uh, collaborative um, partnerships that you can join to support uh, to support you in that work. Okay, Jessica, thank you very much. Now, we're going to move on to the Q&A section now. And I'd like to invite you, Tim, actually, to come up because there is a spot for you here. And, and to start off with, I would quite like to, once you, once you take a seat, but you've been listening to all of this. Um, given, you know, your scene set it before, um, what do you make particularly of what Rue and Christopher are saying about the Danish experience? I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> Can you persuade our politicians to do the same? Um, no, I mean, it's, it's very clear, and you know, so, some of us, Laura, my colleague at the back, and I are working on a project trying to encourage governments to act together to, to move forward on food system transformation. The economic arguments are there, but the political tensions, particularly in some governments 
are such that actually, you know, there is that kind of right-wing ideological approach that we shouldn't intervene in markets to make them right. And it's really nice to have an example where actually the sense of the argument right and left coming together to say actually we do need to do this and do this in a new way. So the fact that there are small parts of the world <laughs> where things are happening gives me hope. And you know, each of the examples that the, the panellists put forward mm -hmm. is all positive. It's just at the moment it's not enough and it's not breaking through at the political level in the way, I mean, I, I would love Rishi to stand up and say, yes, we ought to do something about creating more jobs in the vegetable sector. But the reality is that that's going to be a long time coming. But hopefully, you know, over the, over the next few years, the arguments will grow. And if we do have a change of administration in a couple of years' time, somebody said to me uh, uh, a few weeks ago, there's a lot that we as the Labour Party see in the national food strategy, and we wouldn't necessarily want to reinvent that because there's lots of good work there. So there might be, as pendulums swing left and right, there might be new opportunities open up for political change as we go forward, but it has to be all of us working together. And I think the other point you made, how do you de-risk the arguments? We're in this to make the world a better place for everybody. It's not about making food more expensive. It's, about, it's not about stopping people eating things. It's about making the system better for us, our children, our grandchildren, and the planet as a whole. Um, just before we move on to the questions, Martin, I'd just like to uh, get your perspective. Do you feel that you've actually had political breakthrough? I mean, um, Tim's saying he doesn't think we're necessarily going to see it immediately, but would you say that, you know, you've what kind of response or impact have you seen? So uh, it's an interesting question. Obviously, the, um, the overriding narrative in the media is about small boats um, and is quite hostile to uh, arguments about modern slavery. But um, we have had a fair hearing from DEFRA. We have had a fair hearing from uh, FCBO. We know that FCBO are looking at some MOU agreements um, with source countries um, and, and realising that they need to look at the model. Um, so we see a lot of um, small areas of hope, but, I mean, it's still very early days. Um, and I think... Um, I think that we, we are looking at um, whether we can have dialogue with, with um, the shadow um, administration uh, cabinet um, and just uh, and looking towards uh, a time after the, this current administration. Okay, thank you. So I'd like to open the floor uh, to questions now, um, including to Tim. So please do um, let me know. You've got hands popping up. First of all, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Um, hi, thanks, Susanna. I'm Jeevan Varsig. I'm climate editor at Tortoise. Um, just one point I wanted to pick up in the debate um, was around the actual sales of plant-based meat, which we know are flatlining, particularly because of the cost of living crisis. Beef is cheaper than plant-based protein because the carbon price isn't priced in. Um, how do you square that circle? I guess that's particularly sort of put to uh, Rune Christopher Dragstahl, who's, who's talked about this, but perhaps anyone on the panel. Is it technology? Is it politics? Is it changing customer behavior, what's the way to sort of get around that, that issue? Thanks. Here, thanks a lot for that question. Yeah, of course, it's about how do you get to the level of scale where prices should not be an issue. Of course, there can be, broadly speaking, there might even be this conflict within the, the plant-based debate, you know, whether it should be whole foods cooked from scratch because they are the cheapest. But the thing is, again, that is just difficult. There are lots of barriers for people uh, to that. So then on the other hand, you have, have some of these... Uh, very, yeah, meat imitations, but, but in many countries, they're actually more expensive than the original. So that's really useless for, for they are probably developed for the target group, which is too expensive, for, for whom it's too expensive to buy it. So I think, yeah, the argument we're having in Denmark is at least that you do need the public sector to, to help get a certain volume under, under this. It could also be private companies, anything from conference centers to restaurants, you know, all, all sorts of business, all sorts of Food professionals, in the broad sense, if they do take responsibility, that should give enough volume that would help the prices go lower so regular consumers could also feel they can afford it on an individual basis. But we do have start. I, I'm usually saying we need professional help. Putting the burden on individual consumers is really tricky in the current climate. So all professional actors should help this market get a, a volume by choosing it. And that doesn't mean eradicating meat from the plate, but it's a matter of quantity and how often. Yeah. Tim, I can see you nodding there. Anything to add? 
Well, I mean, if you look at the kind of whole of society costs from climate change, from pollution, from health, you know, all of those externalities, then it's very clear that we shouldn't be in a situation where, for example, you know, if I'm passing through an airport or something and you're looking for a drink, you go into the shops, what do you find? You find bottled water is two pounds and if you go to Boots or somewhere like that, you can get a little thing of milk for 48p or something like that. Why is milk less expensive than bottled water? That's a failure of the system in the sense of the external costs are not incorporated properly into the price. So what I think we need to do is not just think about how do we make this soft and scalable and investable, etc., but how can we actually then also promote the carbon pricing in the right sorts of way, that the internalisation of the external costs at the moment, and it's, it's got to be something, business alone will not solve this, consumers alone will not solve this, this has got to be all of the actors coming together, investors, regulators, business and consumers, citizens, Absolutely. to make it right. Yeah. I was just going to make one small comment, which didn't come out of my remarks and super relevant here, which is, you know, brings it back to why we're talking about the power of policy today. And, and I think this is where well-designed regulation is so important, because actually we can look at kind of the, the incremental change that's happening in the market. We've seen, you know, the leaders that we're engaging with are often already looking at this. They want, you know, consistent data. They're reporting good quality data. But we're really talking about how do we bring the whole market um, into, a, into a better place and actually that will have a positive impact because if we start to get metrics on the percentage of plant-based foods as investors we can then allocate our capital and see the opportunities much more clearly so that, that it really brings us back to what the focus is today which is well-designed regulation plays a really important role I think in, in how we move forward. Okay thank you there was actually a question in the middle of the role yes Lucy thank you. Hi. Thanks very much I had a question I don't know uh, if the panel can give a perspective on it, well, what is the future of labour in this space? If one thinks about agriculture, then um, many years ago when I was growing up in Nottinghamshire, um, farmers would say, to use a gendered term, they couldn't get a good stockman, so they started growing barley, which used fewer people, and also fewer people than growing soft fruits or legumes. I mean, Denmark, what's the labour circumstance that prevents it from being a... Um, modern slavery problem. Okay, th thanks. Um, so um, generally the main concern there's been is like uh, as long as there's, well in the primary production, the actual farmers, you would usually tend to need slightly more labor, especially if you go into to, uh, horticulture and, and, and fruit production. Also if you have a bit more organic, you also, it's more labor intensive. So, so these things, is primary production is not really the concern here, but then when you go into processing, the main concern in Denmark, and that is probably even preventing the government from going even further, is the jobs in the, in the butcheries, uh, basically. The number of jobs there is actually not that large, and actually many of them might even be not be Danish citizens, but still it's part of the debate. Um, um, so uh, in generally in processing, you need to do all this, most of the jobs are just the same ones. It's just something else than, that is being processed at the, within the, the company. You still need a lot of distribution, uh, transportation, uh, logistics, uh, sales, a lot of the stuff, and even for the same kind of level of qualifications, which is also sometimes a concern for certain political parties, the, the kind of labor and the kind of jobs they can get. So it's usually almost a one-to-one, -one, but there could be slightly less jobs in part of the processing, perhaps, but then there might also be slightly more jobs in the primary production. That's at least the argument, the, the kind of debate where it is currently in Denmark. And that is, that is not a concern any longer, I would say. But it's an important part to address, to, to talk about this and look into it. But of course, you need the proper regulations in, in, in place. Um, I can, and of course, the plant-based industry is, is, does not need to be more benign <laughs> than the meat industry. But there, but there can be kinds of jobs which are less, uh, somehow, you don't have as big uh, bodies uh, and also knives and uh, slightly less dangerous, perhaps. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, uh, 
But of course, it all depends on the regulations you generally have in place to protect uh, the labor force, you can say. Um, Martin, would you like to come in here? I mean, I, I think, I think I mean, some people are talking about automation, but I think in, in lots of agricultural jobs, we're a very long way away from that, any form of automation. Um, so I think we do need to accept that there will be uh, a need for low wage or workers. But there are international agreements. There are, um, there are norms and standards um, for that. And, and, and we just need to accept that if we are a country that um, wants to abide by those uh, norms, that there, there's a cost to that. Um, and I think um, that in the short to medium term, we, we're going to have to accept that we're probably going to have to bring in labour from far away, um, but perhaps that can be with a smaller number of com countries. Um, you know, in the in the US, they've just signed a, an, a, an agreement between the US and Mexico um, to ensure that that, that um, there's no um, charging of fees um, for migrants coming into the US, um, and the Mexican government will try to enforce that. So we can see models around the world where. Um, where you could implement in the UK. Thank you. There's a question at the front. Thank you. Hi, Laura Sands, uh, Chair of the Food Foundation. Um, I, I, being involved in a few sort of investment uh, groups and all the rest of it, investors are very worried about risk and long-term liability. And when we start to look at some of the very ultra-processed foods, when we start to look at certain categories of food, that there is almost no debate about whether they are actually delivering a healthy diet or actually creating detriment. And I wonder to what extent, when you're looking at investments, that there is clarity about the long-term responsibility, the risk, I mean, actually, potentially, if one looks at other um, sections, se sectors like um, tobacco, actual liability, and to what extent we can actually promote that as part of risk registers, as part of investment cases, to pivot these companies. Happy to take that. Yeah, happy to take that. Um, the legal liability piece, I might leave to the side. I think someone else probably is better to talk to that. But I think you're, you know, you're absolutely right, and this is really why we want better data because you know we we've got really far in terms of thinking about climate change and and really consistent climate change disclosure but we need to be able to see you know a, a lot of detail around the health and let me just paint a little picture for everyone which is that there are 78 government endorsed nutrient profiling models that are currently out there and companies are honestly overwhelmed by which one do they tie their, their flag to, if they are at all, which is, is still very low. So, you know, retailers are definitely leading the way, but manufacturers are lagging behind, food service companies out of home. A lot of out of home and food service companies are in the pri privately owned, so they're not so, um, you know, accountable to, to, to public market investors. Um, so it's a real challenge um, and, and I think we're still at the very early days and I think what we've really got to try and do and this is why we're <coughs> trying to influence at the sort of system level and trying to influence policy is that we haven't got time to be incrementally kind of engaging company by company. We need to be able to, you know, have some, some sort of transformative, I think you mentioned Tim, you know, that's what we need right now. We haven't got kind of decades to sort this out. Um, so so if, you're, if we're really honest, we can only look to that level, you know, at, at a few companies. And I think the other important thing to say is we are, you know, engaging, I sit within um, the kind of ethical sustainable impact investment business within Rathbone's group, which is called Rathbone Green Bank. And we already have very strict minimum standards, so the companies we're engaging with are actually the leaders on this. And even there, we're seeing, you know, not great disclosure and, and not the ability to compare across, you know, maybe the three retailers or the three manufacturers in our portfolio. So we're a long way away from that. Um, and I think people are waking up to, you know, the National Food Strategy came out at a quite good time, I think, in the terms of it was on people's mind, the link between, you know, uh, unhealthy diet and worse COVID outcomes. You know, it was right there for people to see. And so I think the, the, the sort of public um, awareness of this is, has been growing, and I think we need to harness that. Um, it's, it's combining with kind of increased investor awareness, um, but we need to just, we need to really harness that. Um, and and it would be interesting to see whether, you know, we look to the parallels of climate change and what we've learned there, and there has been increasing litigation. Yes. You know, maybe we'll see that in, in, in the next kind of five to ten years. Thank you. Let me bring in Jessica as well. Yeah, thank you. I think it's a, it's a really good question, and I think within that, what's important is thinking about the timescales of those 
uh, of, of how quickly, uh, how soon or, or near uh, those risks are going to play out and materialise. And so we still see lots and lots of investors um, and lots of companies looking on very short time horizons. And so actually when you look at those time horizons, uh, th those risks aren't necessarily going to, going to materialise. And so we really want to start uh, encouraging and working with investors to look uh, on longer time horizons, but also to give um, greater weight to some of those um, social or environmental you know, ESG factors um, over and above, or at least give, give them equal weight to that kind of financial return so that you know, we are starting to see more and more investors taking these, these risks, some of them you know, far off, uh, into greater account in their stewardship. Um, and I think there's also something, it, it's worth saying, there is a lot increasing data out there in terms of which companies are most at risk, um, and you know, more and more companies are starting to disclose on that percentage of sales coming from healthier or less healthy products. Um, but what we often hear from investors in relation to their work on health is that those um, risks aren't necessarily quantified and that data isn't necessarily quantified in the way that they, they want it to be and in the way that it makes it easier to incorporate into their analysis. Um, so I think that, that would be one of the challenges that we often hear from, from investors. Okay, thank you. Just one more question. I could Yes, go ahead. Um, okay, I'm going to take both of those questions. I can't choose between you. <laughs> so go ahead. I'll take those two. Um, hello. Thank you. Good panel. Um, a couple of questions, really. Um, the first one around policy. Um, if we can get consensus around mandatory reporting, that will be transformational. And that's what the feed FTDP is, is working on. So I urge everyone to feed into that process. And I'd like to understand from the panel where you think you need the biggest push. Um, uh, have we got enough around environment for now? Maybe there's a bit lacking on soil um, nutrition because the nutrition of soil determines the nutri nutrition of food. So do we need to focus more on health? So that's your question around policy. And then on the companies, to every... It's not just the investors in the room, every single stakeholder speaking to companies. Using what we've heard from Martin today, why don't we ask the question, why are only 25% of your food product sales able to be considered healthy? Why is okay. that? Okay, let we me know just that. take that question Fix very it. quickly. Um, to, uh, Sophie, can you take that? Yeah, happy to take the first one first. I think, you know... I think a really important point when we're looking at the Food Data Transparency Partnership is actually we don't necessarily need to reinvent the wheel. There's brilliant civil society organisations. There's you know, a lot of minds that have been looking across health, animal welfare and environment already. Um, and I think it's now, you know, in terms of what, what needs to happen, we need unprecedented collaboration between the different groups that are going to be part of that so that we can, you know, we're not increasing the burden. We're, we're about, you know, actually now together we've got to be really sensible at narrowing that list of, 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 of useful metrics um, if we're going to be pushing for mandatory. So that would be my yep. unprecedented collaboration. Thank you. And Jessica, why can't you uh, go to companies and say, why are only 25% of the products <laughs> that you sell healthy? Yeah, I think we absolutely are starting to have those conversations uh, in terms of our Healthy Markets initiative. Back when we started, we were very conscious of not um, prescribing a target um, proportion of sales coming from healthier products to companies. So what we asked companies to do was to set their own target but to make sure that it was meaningful and that they, they defined healthy using a government-endorsed uh, methodology. I think now that we've got to a point where so many companies have started to disclose that data, we've got a better understanding of where the companies are at and what a reasonable, uh, more prescriptive target might look like. So I think that's definitely something that we could, um, we could be looking to in the future. Great, thank you. And just let me take your question, thank you. Great, thank you. I'm, I'm Tony Bird and I head up a campaign called Make My Money Matter. We've been trying to get uh, UK pensions and banks to invest and finance sustainably. Um, so this is a question for Sophie and Jessica. Um, we've been running a campaign to get UK pensions to align to net zero. Thousands of people wrote to their pension funds. Hundreds of employers are providing their staff with net zero aligned pension schemes. 
And that's led to about 50 pension funds committing to a line to net zero, about one and a half trillion pounds of assets under management. That's fantastic. But a lot of the conversation is about fossil fuels um, or about f more investment in renewables. We've been trying to get pension funds to tackle deforestation, and a major driver of which are food systems, as, as Tim outlined. But only a handful of pension funds are looking at deforestation. And I think very, very few are actually looking at food systems in a serious way, yet they're 30% of emissions. So how do you think we can get them more engaged? You know, this is a long-term financial I'll just take risk. That. What Go can ahead. we do? Yeah, so I think we've talked about a bit today that, you know, investors, we're not new to this, you know, it's been about sort of seven, you know, eight, nine, ten years or something of this, but that was a very small group of investors at that point. Um, and I think it really comes back to data. You know, <laughs> it's taken us a long time to have a policy window to actually influence this process. But one of the reasons the pension funds find this so difficult is that they don't have access to good data on the risks that are facing the food system. So they probably feel quite challenged by, by sort of a campaign like that because actually they just don't know what that risk looks like for them. So I, I, I would say that's, that's a big challenge. So I would encourage, I mean, I think that the work you do is absolutely brilliant. I've long admired it. Um, but sort of engage as part of this process with us, you know, it, it, it's a real opportunity, I think, to have kind of better data. And, and, th and then I think, you know, absolutely put pressure on them when, when, when we've got kind of better data out there. But there is already, you know, there is already some data. So I think having the conversation still gets it on the agenda. You know, often when we're talking to companies, they are so pleased when we just raise issues with them that are, you know, longer term things that they might not get from their, from, from an investor that's just looking at kind of, you know, shorter term material risks. So just having the conversation as much as possible, but also engaging in, in the FTTP would be my, my thing. Great. So very briefly, Jessica, to have yeah, to wrap up. Yeah, sorry, I can't, I'm hiding behind a post. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you are. Um, yeah, no, so, um, Pension funds are a really key player in this, and we we've been long trying to, similar to you, get them to get them get more of them on board with this agenda. One of the things we're actually doing, um, we've got a seat on the task force for social factors, uh, a DWP task force, which is looking at how um, how to better support pension fund trustees to take into account social factors, and within that. Uh, our role, we're going to be really trying to insert health into that conversation. Um, so, so that's certainly one way that we'll be trying to do it. It blows my mind every day that we've still got so many kind of local authority pension funds, for example, uh, you know, local authorities responsible for, for public health, and yet many of them still heavily invested in tobacco at, at the most basic level. Um, so yeah, definitely more work to do. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'm sorry that that's all we have time for in terms of questions right now. But this is time for a very quick coffee break. But please do come back in 10 minutes' time um, because we want to get on and get to as many of your questions as possible a little bit later. So please do come back promptly. Thank you. And thanks very much to the panel for a great discussion. Thank you. Thank you.